of Habakkuk chapter 3 says, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines, the producer, produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. In other words, things are bad. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places to the choir master with stringed instruments. Chapter 3 is a song. It is a prayer. The Bible tells us it's a prayer. And it's a prayer set to music. It's a song. And so the way that this book ends, the way that we have been moving the entire time, the reason that the that the title of this of this series is How Can I Be Happy is because at the very end of the book, Habakkuk says, even if everything is bad, I will still rejoice in the Lord and I will take joy in the God of my salvation. How does he get there? And so uh, today, in today's message, what we're going to see is is the first part of this psalm. And we're gonna we're final we're finally there. We're in the end of Habakkuk, and we're finally getting to the point where Habakkuk has a, has a total turnaround. Because in the very beginning of the book, he starts with, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear, or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed. Justice never goes forth. The wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. He begins with, God, I'm miserable. Lord, I'm miserable and I look around me and everything around me is miserable. And I keep crying out and you don't care. And he ends with... Though everything is bad, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Man, what a shift. What a change. Habakkuk goes, in his book, he goes through a journey. Something changes. The circumstances haven't changed yet, but Habakkuk does a complete 180 in his attitude. Because he says, not only now, but in the future, though things are, are bad, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. And when he makes that journey, when he makes that turn, is in Habakkuk chapter 3. The response to what God has said to him. Because God answers him. And so, what I want you to see today is that God, excuse me, that Habakkuk responds in praise and worship for a reason. And so, so that we have an opportunity to respond like Habakkuk did, we've moved a couple of the songs to behind the message today. So that you won't simply be singing a song before we leave. Oh, sermon's over. <laughs> Let's sing a song and get out of here. But so that the music might be a blessing to you today. It might be an opportunity for you to worship and to praise God in response to what you have seen. Now, um... The title of this morning's message is Remember God is Awesome. How did Habakkuk make this journey? There's several things that God showed him, okay? But this is one of them. That's a lot of pressure on me, right? Because I'm thinking, man, we want them to be able to sing praises to God as awesome after the sermon? The sermon better be awesome. The problem is, I can't guarantee that, right? That's, a, that's depending on a human thing. You know, I hope I do a good job so you know how awesome God is. What I want to happen is for God to show himself to you. I'm going to let him do the work, okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you best I can with, what, what there is in scripture. What I'm going to ask you to do prayerfully as you listen is to ask God to show you his awesomeness, to bring it to mind. There may be some thoughts you have that I don't say, right? Because it, this scripture is going to bring those things to mind. What I want you to be able to do 
is to sing, to respond, not just, not just today, but in the days, weeks, and months, and years to come, God is awesome. Why is that important? Because that's how Habakkuk makes his journey. That's, that's how he changes. So here's what happens. God says to him, oh, I'm doing something. You don't, th- you don't think I'm doing anything? I'm doing something. But you're not going to believe it. <laughs> what I'm doing is I'm raising up the Babylonians to, ju- to judge Judah. And Habakkuk says, that doesn't make sense. They're more wicked and more terrible than we are. Do you not care about sin and about wickedness? And God responds in this way. Oh, I absolutely care. Care very much. That's why I'm raising them up. Because when they're done doing what I tell them to do, I'm going to judge them too. And he says, the just will live by faith. You, Habakkuk, you trust me. And you live by faith. Because they don't. And he proceeds all the way through chapter 2 to show a couple of things. To show how the life of faith looks different than the life of pride. Also to show how everything that the Babylonians do is going to come back on them in judgment. right? And also to show Habakkuk that one of the things that God is going to do is preserve a remnant. Not everybody in Judah is going to die. There are going to be people who are rescued and people who see God's judgment on the Babylonians. And one of the things that Habakkuk says is, Oh Lord, you're going to see this in a moment. In your wrath, remember mercy. There's really three key passages to remember from from Habakkuk. So years from now, when you think about Habakkuk, I know you're not going to remember every verse. You're not going to remember every sermon. I know that. There are three things you should remember. Number one, you should remember the just will live by faith. Number two, you should remember that Habakkuk said, Oh Lord, in your wrath, remember mercy. And the third thing you should remember is what we'll be talking about in two weeks, is when Habakkuk is able to say, Somehow, though everything is bad, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Now, how does he make that journey? Well, by the time we get to chapter 3, we see that Habakkuk has already turned. He's already changed. And what he's doing here is he is remembering that God is awesome. And so if you want to be this sort of person who can say with Habakkuk, though my car is broke down, though my kids don't listen to me, though I'm out out of a job, though I can't pay my bills, though everything that's supposed to work isn't working, yet I'll rejoice in the God of my salvation. If you want to be able to do that, it starts with realizing what it means to live by faith, being thankful for the mercy that God has shown you when he poured his wrath out on Jesus on the cross, and by remembering that God is, is awesome. So here's how Habakkuk ends chapter 2 verse 20. This is the last thing that God says to him in chapter 2 verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. And so in reflection, right, or in knowing that God judgment is coming, God is about to speak, you be quiet. And so I don't know for how long Habakkuk was, But I think that during that time of silence, I think Habakkuk learned the lesson. He figures it out. And then we get to see what that looks like. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. And so for a period of time, we don't know how long. Was it moments? Was it hours? Was it weeks? Even years? But after a period of time of silence, I think that Habakkuk wrote this song. And so here's the heading. Here's a prayer of Habakkuk. And that, that is a musical term there. We don't know exactly what it means, except for this prayer is set to music. Now let's look at verse 2. Here is his song. O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath. Remember mercy. And so, Lord, I've heard what it is that you have done, and I am praying that you will bring it back. 
Well, this is amazing, right? Because he, he knows that God is going to come in judgment through the Babylonians, and he's saying, revive your work and make it known to others. But as you do it, Lord, in your ma- wrath, remember mercy. And st- see how there's been a shift here. Habakkuk is no longer worried about God. You should judge all of the other people. Look at all the people doing wrong. You should do something about that. Now that God says he's going to do something about it, Habakkuk, I think trembling, says, in wrath, remember mercy. You know, be careful what you pray for. He, that's what he was asking God to do. He was asking for wrath. And now that it's coming, he says, in your wrath, remember mercy. Mercy. Why? Because Habakkuk needs mercy. You and I need mercy. And this is the beginning of the song. Lord, do your work, but as you do, please show me mercy. And so here here the psalm begins. Look at verse 3. God came from Taman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Now, what is he talking about? This is a reference to Uh, the area that you all know as Edom, just before they move into the promised land. And Mount Paran is a reference to Mount Sinai. And so here's what he's saying. He's saying, God, as you took your people out of Egypt and you moved us to Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments and you you showed your glory to Moses and his people, and you showed your glory through the parting of the Red Sea. And you showed your glory over and over and over again as you guided your people through the wilderness. And as you showed your glory as you moved us into the promised land. Right? You did all of these things. And what was their response? His splendor covered the heavens. And the earth was full of his praise. And so your creation, Lord, your inanimate creation, the sky and the earth, praise you when you showed your glory. So it's kind of interesting, right, that what we don't hear about is the response of human beings because I don't think they fully were aware of how glorious God was, but his creation was witness to it and praised him because of it. Now, one of the things that happened there in the wilderness is God said to his people, you be holy as I am holy. And God showed his holiness. And the earth covered the heavens. And the earth was full of his praise. In Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14, the writer says, Without holiness, no one shall see God. Because God is set apart. And holy means to be set apart for God's purpose. So if you have a holy Bible, that's books set aside from God. If you have holy anything, it's something that's been set aside for God. This building is holy in the sense that it is set aside for God. You are holy in the sense that you are set aside for God. God is holy. He is set aside for himself and set apart. And nothing that is unholy can enter into his presence, O oh Lord. In your wrath, remember mercy. And this is what the Bible says we have. You and I have righteousness. We've been declared holy because of what Christ has done on the cross. And so we get to join with heaven and earth and sing, declare his praise. What's, how do the stars declare God's praise? How does the Grand Canyon butterflies, babies, the harvest moon. How do they declare his glory? Just by existing, right? You, as a saved person that God has rescued from hell and damnation, who is rescued from your own sin, he, you, by existing as one of his redeemed ones, you declare his glory for eternity just by existing. Which means, by the way, when you come across another Christian that has been redeemed and rescued and saved from sin, that person ought to also make you go, wow, another one that God saved and rescued. Another person who declares God's glory and holiness and greatness and mercy just by existing because you too have been saved. Now look at verse 4. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. 
Now, what is Habakkuk singing about? He's singing about Mount Sinai. He's singing about God, excuse me, Moses going up into God's presence and, and the light of God's glory so ref, those shining on Moses that it reflects off of him when he comes down from the mountain that people say, ah, we can't handle it. And they have to put a veil over it. Another way to translate this word ray, and you've probably seen it translated this way before, is it can be translated as horn, more literally. In a figurative sense, it's a ray, right? Because it comes out from Moses or out from God. But, uh, but literally, it's a horn. So you're supposed to picture light coming out almost as a physical thing, just seeing the rays as though you can just, just touch it, and the glory is real. Now, the, the concept of a horn is interesting because the horns in the Old Testament represent power and strength. And so his brightness, God's brightness was like light. The, the horns, the light rays flash from his hand, and he had to veil his power. Let me show you one verse. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 2. Now we can do this for every verse all the way through the song. I can show you other verses in the Old Testament that, that Habakkuk is alluding to or mentioning or quoting from, but that'll slow us down. But I, what I want you to know is what he is describing here, this song is just saturated in scripture. It is just full of the Bible and the things that God has already done. But here's, here's one verse. The, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. And so here we see that Mount Paran is another name for Sinai. Seir is where, uh, is where um, the other place is Edom, uh, where he was, that Habakkuk's been talking about. And it says he came from the ten thousands of holy holy ones. Now, a holy one can, uh, there's a word that we use for that, which is saints, right? But is anyone but has been set aside as holy with flaming fire at his right hand. And so what we remember is God showing his awesomeness to the Egyptians as he pronounces judgment on each Egyptian god through his plagues, as he shows his awesomeness by parting the Red Sea, as he showed his awesomeness as he gives manna from heaven to his, to, his, uh, to his people, and on and on and on again. Now let's look at back at verse 4. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand, and they, there he veiled his power. He had to because it was too awesome for people to even look at his reflection. Now look at verse 5. Describing God manifesting his presence. God is coming and he is awesome in his glory. Before him went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. <laughs> He's got disease ahead of him and disease behind him. Now for ancient people, disease is something that was terrifying. They didn't understand it. They didn't have control over it. They didn't have vaccines. They didn't know what to do. And so for pagan peoples who didn't have God, that all they could do was pray to their gods to, to a rescue because it was so weird and mysterious. Suddenly, someone would come down with fever and they didn't know why. Sudden, suddenly, somebody's skin is covered in boils and they didn't, they didn't know why. All of a sudden, someone just, someone just gets sick or their, their legs start swelling up and turning colors and they didn't know why. Now, all they could do was just, is just pray to the gods. But now, we human beings have total control over disease, right? Every disease that comes our way, we take care of. We fix every one of them. We have a cure for every disease and viruses don't spread and we don't get nervous about it because we can totally handle it now, right? I'm being sarcastic. I was watching for the smiles. You going, some of you are going, he's wrong. He's wrong. Look, the, honestly, what's going on in the news right now is a reminder of this. We don't have control. Like, we're not really in charge. So we, we, I think that God has given us science and he's given us medicine. And those are examples of grace. But every now and then we get reminders, right? We're not fully in charge. 
there's a whole lot of stuff we can't cure. I'm like, I don't want to say I laugh literally because I don't because it's sad and difficult, okay? But in, in a darkly humorous way, humans cure this disease, right? And up comes another one we've never heard of or we don't know how to deal with. And so we, we work on that one and we cure that one. And up comes another one. We don't know how to deal with it. And over and over and over again is an ongoing battle. Why? Because we're not really in charge. And so this, the, the, what's in the news right now is, is honestly right, a reminder that there are forces at work that are way more powerful than we are. Oh, and you're thinking, oh, you know what, though? We're going to get a vaccine worked out in about a year or so. Yeah. And eventually, you know what? There's going to be another one. There's going to be another disease. There's going to be another problem that humans can't solve. Why? <laughs> because God's creation itself is bigger and more powerful than we are. The only one who is the most powerful is the one who created all of these things. He is the one who is in charge. And so look at the picture that Habakkuk, I mean, yes, let's use what's in the news right now. There are people panicking. And I'm not saying it to make fun of it, but you know, you look at pictures of certain parts of the world and everybody's walking around wearing masks. They're terrified. It's scary. Maybe some of you are like that. Some of you are already getting fearful. And God is more powerful than all of that. He is awesome. Of course, this is also a reminder that don't be too quick to wish for God to come and punish people because God can come in judgment, right? And so here, so here he comes and look at this description. This is terrifying because God is awesome. Look at verse 7. Sorry, I I almost skipped one. Sorry, verse 6. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations, and the internal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. When we read that again, I want you to absorb that and think about this, this verse and what's being described here. He stood and measured the earth. How does God do that, right? If he's spirit, he's not physical, but if he were... Look at how big that is. He stood and measured the earth. He just looks and the nations shake. Now, I know you have a little glimpse of this, right? Because your mama had a look, right? Your mom had a way of looking at you that just filled you with terror. God made your mama. God, with a look, shakes the nations, and they tremble. The eternal mountains, the mountains that seem so majestic and so huge and seem like they've been there forever and like they're going to be there forever, God looks, and the mountains go crumble. The hills sink. This is how awesome his way. He, he is. The mountains, though they seem timeless, and they're so big, and they've been here long before we were here, and they're going to be here long after God with a look, and they're gone. He is the one who is truly everlasting. Even his inanimate creation responds to his awesomeness. How are you and I going to respond? And then verse 7, I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction. The curtains, now in English we say of the land of Midian. In Hebrew it's Kushan and Mid- Midian. So there is a rhyme here. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Now there's some discussion about what he means by Cush here. Uh, some people think that he's referring uh, to the ancient land of Cush of Ethiopia. Others refer, think he's referring to the nomadic tribe that uh, Moses' wife was from. She's described as a Cushite. But the more likely explanation is that this is a reference to a king, a Mesopotamian king in Judges chapter 3, who's named 
Kushan. And what happens here in the tent is that this is in the book of Judges. When God has sent people, foreigners, to judge the Israelites because they were not obeying God, and they cry out to him, and he sends a rescuer. rescuer. And then there's another judge in Judges, maybe you've heard of. His name is Gideon. And it is the Midianites that Gideon fights. And he is terrified of them. He is so scared, and he's not sure that he can go up against them. And so God allows him to get close to the Midianite camp and to hear them talking about how they are afraid of Israel's God. And he listens to them trembling in their tents. And so in the book of Judges, over and over and over again, the Israelites face enemies that are so much bigger than them. And they cry out to God, and God sends them a, a rescuer, and they are rescued. Then we get to verse 8. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea when you rode in your horses on your chariots of salvation? What he's remembering is God rescuing the people over and over in occasions where there is water. Because for, for the Hebrew mindset, water for them was scary. They were, they were landlubbers. They were not seafaring people. They did not like the ocean. It was, didn't just get them seasick for them. It was chaos. It was uncontrolled. And so when you see in the Old Testament references to God controlling the sea, when you see it in the New Testament, it's a reminder that, that what you and I consider chaos, what you and I consider unknowable, what you and I consider uncontrollable, God controls. And so God sends the people through the Red Sea as though it's dry land. God sends the people through the, through the River Jordan on dry land. And over and over and over again, he throws, shows his power against the water. And what's the answer to this question? Is your wrath against the rivers? No, he's not mad or angry at the rivers. He's going to deal with people. And then we get to verse 9. This is the last verse we're going to look at today. We're doing the first half of the song. Next week we'll do the second half of the song. And the third week we'll look at Habakkuk's conclusion. You strip from the sheath your bow, calling for many arrows should be terrified when God gets out his bow for a long time and and pardon me I'm just gonna I'm gonna admit this to you for a re, for a really really long time I couldn't figure out why a rainbow is called a rainbow I mean it doesn't look like a hair bow right I mean that's what I thought I thought, I thought a rainbow it doesn't look like a hair bow it doesn't look like a hair ribbon the girls put in their hair it doesn't look like a bow you put on a package. I finally figured out it's not a reference to a hair bow or a bow. And a, the rainbow is God's bow. And instead of it pointing down to earth, right, when he, when he gives this gift to Noah and to all peoples after, he says, look, I'm laying down my bow. It's not pointing at you. It's pointing back at me, right? If God picks up his bow, that ought to be, terrifying and here we have Salah pause and wait so we think we think that's what Salah means we don't know it's a musical term uh, the best guess I've seen and the most common one is that this is some kind of a pause either of silence or of music it is a time for reflection to think about what you just heard so this is where we're going to stop. And so as I conclude, here's what I leave you with. Habakkuk said, the just will live by faith. I'm not very good at fixing things. Terrible at it. Love it when somebody else comes along and says, here, I'll fix that for you. Because what I get to do is I get to step back and say, I have no idea what you're doing. I don't understand all the tools and the turnings and all of this. I don't. But I trust that when you're done, it's just going to work. <laughs> and it's great, right? We don't know what all God is doing and how he's going to do it. 
but the just will live by faith. We can step back and say, I don't totally understand what God's doing. What I'm looking at here doesn't totally make sense, but I trust that when he's done, it's all going to work. And so Habakkuk has come to this place where he has faith. That's why he's able to sing these songs. That's why he's able to declare the awesomeness of God. Because even as the mountains tremble, he has citizenship in a kingdom that does not tremble. God's kingdom. And that is true for you. Though the nations rage, the politics and things in this country seem ridiculous. Though there are plagues and pestilences for real in the world. Though there are issues and illnesses and difficulties and problems in your life. God is over all of it. And he is more awesome than all of that. The just will live by faith. Though your world may be shaking right now as I speak. Both the big world, right, and the little sphere that God's placed you in. You, if you know Jesus, you have citizenship in the land that cannot be shaken. God is awesome. Please join me as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for this reminder that you have given me. When I need this today. But my prayer is that you would continue to show your awesomeness to us. Lord, as we sing here in a moment, and my prayer is not just for voices, but for hearts, that you would continue to show your greatness and your glory to us. The yes, maybe we tremble a little. but also singing praise because in your wrath you remembered mercy and you sent us Jesus and we stand before you righteous because of what Christ has done. As soon as we sing your praises, we sing today we sing praises for the stars and moon and sun and mountains and rivers and ocean that you made. We sing praises for all the, the grand and small creatures that you have placed in them. And we sing your praises for rescuing people, your image bearers, that we might declare your glory forever. And so we close very seriously this prayer when we pray in Jesus' name. It is because of him that we can sing and will declare your praises forever. Amen.